Today, I'll be reading Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Again, that's Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. And it reads, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Napoli. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you, as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of the Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke, the burdens that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, throw out their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For, uh, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Thank you, Josiah. Well, it's been a crazy week. I don't know about for you has been for me. Do you like my Alaska shirt? <laughs> uh, I had to make a trip recently up there, so uh, I'm sure you were able to enjoy the elders speaking last week and explaining the, the plan and what we're going to be doing, and uh, some notes are in the bulletin uh, this week about that, so you can uh, kind of remember and keep that in front of you for uh, what we're going to be doing. Wednesday, we delivered presents. That was a great time, being able to go to a family that didn't know who we were, but just knew that we were coming. And so we walked in, and uh, they were excited to see us. And there was a tree with no presents, and we completely filled the tree. And that was one of the neatest things. And that's all thanks to you guys, because of all the presents that you brought and all the times when you were able to give. So that was really good. Um, one of the things to celebrate, the office is closed next week. <laughs> Just letting you know ahead. So if you call and we don't answer, it's because we're not here. Uh, I am excited about the next quarter that's coming up. Uh, this Wednesday, there'll be a devotional, but then the next week, classes are going to begin. And so there's going to be lots of good things that are beginning from that. And so uh, I'm excited about all of that coming. All right, let's get to talking about Jesus today because he's the most important thing that we're going to deal with. The passage Josiah has read to us comes out of Isaiah chapter 9, and this is about a thousand years before Jesus. And so they're telling you what's going to happen. They're telling you that there's hope. They're telling you that people who have been in darkness and people who have been away from God and people who have been completely sinful and turned away from God are, are now going to be able to come back, that there's going to be a new place for their nation who had been rejected, who would be rejected. And so as you look at this, it's God's story again. God's story is always from darkness to light. And so when we understand God's story is always that, it's not like what we see our story sometimes as the good years are way behind us, and those were the good old days, and now it's not so good. Well, what you need is God in your life, because every time the good days are ahead of you, and God always leads us to greater and greater glory. And that's just one of the things we're able to see about him, and it does take our involvement, it does take our working with him, but he is always bringing about this increase in joy, this joy over the harvest, this yoke of the oppressor that is broken, this time when the, the boot-tramping warriors are defeated, that's got to sound good to people who have been oppressed by another country, and it's all good news. Then he says the reason is because there's a child. You're like, wait a minute, 
all of those blessings God's given, and it's really because there's a child. For to us, a child is born, a son is given, and government rests on his shoulders. Don't you wish it was that way? Government rests on his, and, but we're thinking, well, wait a second, how can that be? What kind of a government's really run by a child? He's also called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All of these names that you see for God, that's who he is. The increase of his kingdom is going to be forever. He's going to sit on the throne of David. It's going to last forever. And all of these things we see is this great time where we're able to understand what God is doing and how God works through history and that those are all promises but we tend to get lost there because those are all promises for another time and another day and another place and I'm not really sure they fit me well let's talk about that a little bit today when you look at the story of Jesus and look at what it really was about it it all begins with an angel who comes to Mary In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, to the house of David, to the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. Gabriel is one of the angels that we have mentioned in the scriptures. We understand who Gabriel is. He's one of the mighty angels. He's also the one that came to Daniel as you read the book of Daniel. And so we see him connected at different places in history. And he brought good news to Daniel as well and understanding to Daniel. And now he comes to Mary and he brings good news and understanding to Mary as we Look at what happens with her. Mary is the favored one. God is with you. Always be suspicious of that. And she is. She's like, what kind of a greeting is this? Because God is saying, you know, I'm the favored one. Uh, what do you, you know how it is when your kids say, oh, I love you. Yeah, what do you want? <laughs> it's kind of like that because God is saying, you know, you're the favored one. You're the great and she goes, yeah, what do you want? And uh, it doesn't really matter. Mary is one of those people who knows God, who loves God, but she still wants to know what it is. And so she is the favored one, and the, and the angel tells her that you will conceive and bear a son. You're going to call his name Jesus. He's going to be great. He's going to be the son of the Most High. He will sit on the throne of David all of these huge, great promises, and they're coming to Mary. He's going to reign over the house of Jacob forever. And her question is, how? How is this going to happen? She knows it's impossible. She says, I'm a virgin. I haven't had sex. I know how babies work. I know I can't have one. And the angel basically says, don't worry about it. God knows what he's doing. Nothing is impossible with God. The Holy Spirit's going to take care of that. But you are going to have this new child, this answer that has come after 400 years of silence. And we're able to see how this great plan of God begins to unfold. And it's very, very personal to Mary. Because it's about her. It's about her baby. It's about her life. Nothing is impossible with God. She is chosen for one reason, because she's willing. I don't know if you realize how big that is, but it seems to be getting bigger and bigger in our world today. When you ask people for things and they, you know, explain what you need and they say, not my problem, right? Didn't hire me for that. Mary could have easily said, well, yeah, that sounds great. Find someone else. No. You know what Mary says? 
Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That's all the angel needed to hear. And he leaves. He already knew that going in. He already knew what kind of person she was. He already knew she was willing. And I think maybe that's the biggest thing in being able to see God and understand God and receive all those blessings and to make your life go from darkness to light, from bad to good. And so if you're depressed or if you think things are not good right now, this is the key, all right? To be willing. That's what brings you from darkness to light. That's what brings you into the will of God. And when we bring God into our life and we're able to see all of those great things that God does in our life, all we have to do is be available. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be. She accepts whatever God wants. And that's where we begin to see light in unusual places. Light in very personal places. Not just light anywhere, not light in all the big things that happen, but it's light because people are willing, and that seems to be the key. Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a relative of hers, and she goes, and sure enough, Elizabeth is pregnant also. She's a little bit further along, and she goes there, and the babies recognize each other. I don't know how that works. I've been able to feel babies that move, but somehow the babies know, oh, there he is. And you can watch little kids, not babies, but little kids after they see each other, you watch them as you take them along, and, but there'll be another kid way over there somewhere. All of a sudden, they perk up and they start waving, hi, hi, because they recognize each other. They know each other. And that's what they do. And, and without knowing each other, they, they recognized the bond that they had in God, and they recognized each other. Mary sings a song, or makes a song. We don't use this one very much, but we are going to sing it at the end, Michael. It's Mary's song. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked upon the humble estate of his servant. And behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. And he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his, his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. He has scattered and exalted with those with humble estate. He has filled with the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spoke to the, our fathers, Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned home. My soul magnifies the Lord. My soul rejoices because a son is going to be born. He has looked upon my humble estate. And you know the story. I mean, she's not married and all of a sudden news of a baby. And that's not always good if you're not married yet. Okay, babies are good, but I'm not sure the timing is done real well. And so Joseph decides through a little intervention from God. No, I'm not going to leave her. We're going to get married, and she's going to go through all of the things that this means. It's not an easy thing, I don't think. But there was no dissension that she told the angel, nothing about this that seemed bad or hard. And so it's just the fact that everybody's going to call me blessed, and God has seen where I am. He's seen that I'm not rich, that I'm not mighty. In fact, that's who God brings down, and God lifts up the people who are humble. And this is all about the humble being lifted up and the proud being brought down. And she knows about the promise to Abraham, but she's going to have some difficulty with this. It's not going to be easy as she brings a new baby in because the community, you know how they talk. You know what's going to be said. 
Now, when is your anniversary? And how old is Jesus? Women do math amazingly quick. <laughs> Guys, they couldn't tell, you know. Uh, okay, that's fine with me. She would have to explain how she's pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. She would have to explain how old Jesus is. Do you lie then? When you're carrying the Son of God, do you fudge the figures a little bit? Can you do that? It's a lot of inconvenience. She's looking at what God can do, but it's a little bit difficult, isn't it? And she finds herself in the middle of history. There's a lot of things that are going on in the world at this time. Remember, the wise men are going to come and Herod's going to say, what king? I don't want there to be another king. And as he does that, she realizes it's because of her child that a lot of other babies are going to be killed. And if she just you know, gave up her child and said, okay, mine was the king, we'll deal with it, and I'll save all the other babies. But she's got to say no and realize that's her neighbor's. Not only that, but she's got to run away and go all the way down to Egypt just to get out of this to be able to keep him safe. And just her child being born puts all other children that are male and his age in danger. They live in constant danger. They finally are able to come back and it means that she's going to have to kind of lay low and not tell too much and it also means she's going to lose her son early. He's not going to live that long. He's going to be very popular. That would be great. Not necessarily rich, but very popular for a while. And then he's going to be completely despised, and he's going to be rejected, and he's going to be thought of as this great teacher, and then he's going to be branded as a false teacher, one who's a traitor, one who's an enemy of Caesar, one who... Even she thinks sometimes he's crazy because he doesn't quite do things right. And she watches Jesus walk right into the middle of all the anger and hatred of the world for him and realize that's my son. But she kind of stood up to people when the baby came. When Gabriel asked, let it be done. And so at 12, when... He has to be about his father's business, and they can't find him for three days. And they finally find him in the temple, and, well, I've got to be about my father's business. If anybody understands that, she ought to understand that, because that's what she said. I will be about my father's business. I am willing. And that's what Jesus says at 12. I'm going to be involved in this. Jesus is very personal in her life. Jesus is her son, and she realizes this is one of the things that makes God so important and so personal to her. Jesus always works best that way, doesn't he? He never healed a crowd of people and said, all right, everybody with allergies has been healed. All right, everybody with pain, the pain is gone. It was not clearing a hospital, bless this hospital, all you people can walk out now. Every single person was very, very personal. And that's what he did. And that's the way Jesus worked. And that's where we can see God. Because that's where we are. Jesus always works that way. We read stories about great people in the Bible and how they're heroes of faith and all of that, and then we have to realize, you know, we're the guy standing there with the sling hunting a round rock. It's in our hand. And God is personal then. I am willing is some of the most powerful words ever. Maybe we miss God sometimes because we're not willing we get tired we want to break no one else does as much as we do well that's not really true but sometimes it feels that way right but we are his story 
It is inside of us. It is what we are doing. Would you want Mary to be in our church? Would you want Jesus to grow up here? That would be great, wouldn't it? Let me just ask you, would you be willing to teach Jesus class? Yeah. Well, no, I don't do that. Well, let's make it a little bit more personal because we kind of disconnect at this point. Did you see the other kids that were in here before they left? Would you be willing to be God's servant and teach their class? You see, sometimes we remove ourselves from it, and somehow Jesus grew up, and somehow Jesus got all this knowledge, but somehow our kids are going to grow up, and are they going to have knowledge? Because who's going to teach them? Are you willing to be in the Word of God and be God's servant? I am willing. That's all it means. Are you willing to watch Jesus as he runs by and almost knocks you down? Yeah, I'm not thinking he's any different than any of the kids we've got already. So don't fool yourself into thinking he's the one who sits there after church with his hands folded, this little glow around him in the pew as he's so good and waits patiently for his parents to finish talking. No, I think he was a child, and he's a child like every other child. But how important is it that we train our children right? How important is it that we accept single moms because she doesn't keep Joseph very long? I don't know exactly when it is, but after 12 and before 30, Joseph is no longer in the picture. So it's a, at some point, she's a young mom who's got a teenage boy. Do they have a place here? How important is it? that we be involved with the people who are right in front of us. And that's where God's work takes place. We must not think of God's work as being far away. Would we insist that our kid be in Jesus' youth group? Wouldn't that be nice? We would win every Bible bowl that there was. You realize that? Wouldn't that be great? There, uh, just put Jesus on the team. Let's put him on all the teams. You know, would you, well, do you send your kid to youth group now? Do you make sure that they go there? Do you make sure that they're involved with God and with the things that are right in front of you? Are they willing to be more blunt, to be able to do some things that's going to make them like people of God? Because I think sometimes it's us that misses the opportunity here. And what Jesus did in this story of this birth, it's so very personal. Nobody misses the fact that, oh, I had a baby? I, that was yesterday, I forgot. No, you know if it's in your house. Now, you may miss everybody else's and say, oh, they had a baby? I didn't notice Would God choose us because he knows we are willing? And so what's your picture of Jesus' life? What's it like? We see him as a historical character most of the time, and that's what we think about. That's what we realize. He's a miracle worker. He turned water to wine and fed the 5,000 with fish and bread. And so he did lots of things with miracles and with food. And he healed disease. He healed the blind and the lame and even people who had died. We see him as a great teacher with parables, examples. He's the best life coach ever. We see him in scripture, but we don't see him as much in our life. Even though babies are born all around us, even though there is disease all around us, even though we eat, not fish and bread all the time, but we eat, we learn and those are all the same activities of what Jesus did. And somehow, just the fact that Jesus did them, we say, wow, that was amazing. Well, because there was something amazing about the way in which he did it. Can there be something amazing about the way we do it with God? We see a gap in the glory of Jesus in our life sometimes. We see the glory of God in 
scripture, or some people see it, we're supposed to see it, and sometimes it's, well, yeah, we've got the book. It's hidden somewhere. We lost it now. We see the glory of God in church, or do we just say, well, uh, they get after me if I don't attend, and it's just all about attendance. You know, it's about glory of God in his church. Do we see the glory of God in other people's lives that are just like us? That God is working. We see Jesus as he explains God and as he does so many things with God. Look at John chapter 1 and verse 14. It says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What an incredible thing to say. The word of God, the scripture of God became physical and lived in your house and went to your church and attended your school and was in your youth group and it was in every Bible class, whether it's teens or adults. If you want to find God, find God in all of those things that are just normal things because that's where Jesus was. He was in all of those things, and sometimes we skip over all those normal things. He dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He comes after me and ranks before me, because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And he has made him known and he has explained him. Did we get it? Did you get the text that said, here's what God is, here's how God looks like as he is on earth Here's how he looks. And so many times we miss it because he looks so ordinary. And he still does, through ordinary things, those incredible things of glory. And one time a year, people will stop and they'll notice, oh, guess what, there was a birth. It probably wasn't this time of year, but... Okay, let's go with it. Everybody celebrates it now, so let's certainly think about what God was doing. He was sending the word in physical flesh. And what I want to tell you today is he has sent his word into your life in physical ways that are right in front of you if you are willing. And if you are not, you will miss it. Because Mary was willing. God found in human form is Jesus. God is seen in babies. God is seen in teenagers with babies. The explanation begins with a stable, a manger, a baby that's born. It begins with very humble beginnings. And that's where God works best. No one ever expected it there. And not everyone accepted it, even when they were told. Herod went looking for him, uh, not accepting that he was the king. And certainly Pilate didn't accept that either, or the Pharisees, or the scribes, or the Sadducees. And there were a number of people who said, no, he's absolutely not the king. He's not God. He's not from God. And it's so easy to miss that. And so it's not as if there weren't a lot of people against all of that in his world. In Matthew 11, Jesus talks about cities where he taught and healed and the fact that they didn't even notice that he was there. They didn't repent. They didn't see anything about him. Chorazin, Bethsaida, he says, Tyre and Sidon would have repented in a heartbeat if I'd done the miracles there that I did in you. And they just didn't even notice if he'd taught all those things and Jesus was right in front of them. Matthew eleven twenty five 25 says, At that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding 
and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's not so far away from you. And that's what he's trying to get across. I'm thankful to God because he's revealed them in those other places that are not the, the hugely important places. He's revealed them in every ordinary life. And that's where we find him the most. And that's where we see him the most. He's hidden them from the wise and from the ones who think they're so smart. He's revealed them to children. He's revealed them to us. And no, I didn't just call you stupid, by the way. But so many people miss him. Because they're looking for something that is great and grand and glorious. And God is revealed to the humble and to the lowly because they are willing. And that's what it makes all the difference. No one knows except the ones he chooses to reveal himself to. And who is that? The ones who are willing. The ones who work. Right? Come to me all who labor the ones who are involved the ones who are there the ones who are trying the ones who are doing not the ones who sit around and say well i hope god comes sometime but the ones who made it a point to go to jesus to find jesus to put jesus into their life and god is not far from you and so god is revealed in times like that what is it that helps Jesus reveal himself to us. He's revealed to the ones that work too hard. I don't know if that gives you um, guilt or if that uh, makes you happy, but that's where he is. He's revealed to the ones who work too hard and he says, you need some rest. Take my yoke and learn of me because this life is way too much to handle. C.S. Lewis said this, the Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. And that's really what it's all about. And so let me just ask you, where does God shine in your life? Can you see him? Is he obvious? Would you notice Jesus if he was born? Would you notice if he grew up in our congregation? Would you notice if he was in the youth group? Would you be involved with helping him get where he he is now through his Bible class back to heaven. It's so easy to miss in all those things. Let me see if I can do this or not. I brought my flashlight today just so you could see. Can you see if it works? A little bit, maybe. Not much. Can you see it now? You see, the trouble is we have so much static around us. We have so many things around us that is all going on and it's blinding what God is and who God is. You get so much noise in your car because the stereo's turned up so loud that you can't even hear the police siren behind you. The light of God is right there. He's right here. And sometimes we can't see him because there is so much life going on that we don't even realize it. Don't miss God. He's here, he's in your life, and he is personal as he can be. And if he's not, then maybe it's time to open up. Maybe it's time to realize how great God is and all the great things God can do. It's not that the flashlight doesn't work, but it only works at night. It doesn't work in the daytime, and it's not that it's not working, it's that there's too much sunshine. 
So maybe that's why we see God easier when we get in times of trouble, in times of difficulty. And we think God leaves us then. No, he doesn't leave us. He is there all the time. He is always shining. Are we always looking? Today, if we can help you to find Jesus, we want to do that. Okay, let's have lights back, because I want you to be able to find your way to sing. Let's stand and sing together. If we can help, come, let us talk.